Hmm. Let's just take a minute to reminisce on how awesome the 90s were. We've got the offspring. We've got Pokemon cards. We've got South Park before it became all digital. We've got Game Boy Colors. We've got, I mean, Kangaroo Jack. No. No. No Kangaroo Jack. Not reminiscing over. We're done. Okay. Now that we've done that, though, we can put ourselves in the mindset of Stephen Machmus and the Jicks. After all, this man is from the definite era of his life came from Pavement, and Pavement was a 90s band if there ever was one, and this is a reminiscent album. He really just doesn't care, and I don't think that's really important on this album, really. So, first, let's do the famous little bit. Here's a little history. So, Stephen Malkmus and the Jicks is it a rock band consisting, of course, of Stephen Malkmus. Oh my god, I know, right? Mike Clark, Jonah Bloom. Jake Morris. Of course, Malcolmus is the lead singer and songwriter behind this and the influential band, Pavement. This, of course, came before the whole Pavement reunion. It started in 2000. It was almost immediately after Pavement's 99 hiatus in 2000 when they recorded the title Swedish Reggae. That's right. They just called it, though, Stephen Malcolmus. After that, though, eventually they went on a few more things, and Pig Lib would re release in 2003. This stuff is usually known to feature strange indie songs with weird, out-of-nowhere guitar solos and somewhat, what would we call it, different lyrics. We'll call it that. Differently poetic lyrics. So, Face the Truth came in 2005 with positive reviews, and it was kind of their return to form. The album was recorded in Malkmus alone in his basement, although each member of the Jicks did play one song on the record. The band only toured briefly behind this because Malkmus had a child. In 2006, they reported by Pitchfork that John Mullet had become a full-time member of the Decemberists and been replaced by Janet Weiss. So, yeah. The band's fourth album, Real Emotional Trash, was recorded at Snow Ghost, Whitefish, Montana, in 2008. And after that, of course, we got ourselves the last album before this, which was 2011's Mirror Traffic, produced by Beck. Yeah. That was a jam album. This one's not so much a jam album at all. This is called Wig Out at Jag Bags, and that gets us to 2014. Alright. So, this album is... He takes all his critiques and puts them into a sound that he just doesn't care. He's been called dad rock, lackadaisical, with just jargons and left turns out of nowhere, and no direction at all, but I think that he just does, he takes those critiques and actually puts them in as a lyric, like, he doesn't even want to care, like, in Rumble at the Rambo, this is a real lyric, come and join us in this punk rock tomb, come slam dancing with some ancient dudes, we are returning, returning to our roots, yeah, he doesn't care what you think, not even a little bit, in fact, I don't think he cares even what he thinks anymore, this is such a slow, easygoing album, but it's just, like, he doesn't feel the pressure to write, you know, highly influential, deep albums anymore. He just feels like writing whatever he feels like writing. And that's what this album comes across. It's this fun, pretty, romantic rock songs for grown-ups seeking to look back a little bit on their 90s, fun, exacerbated, over-the-top lifestyles because this is a nostalgic trip for him as well. So when you go down the album, let's do the album rundown. When you go down the album, it kind of goes as follows. It starts off with Planetary Motion, which is an in-your-face mix of like indie and weird punk, almost like if you mix Black Sabbath with the Shins. I know it's such a strange thing to say, but that's sort of what it sounds like to me, because it's just guitar-y out of nowhere, and the wordplay is that of the Shins, James Mercer, and it's crazy all over the tour. It's just equally clever and strange, I think. Two parts clever, three parts strange. The next one's called Janitor Revealed. It's another little weird indie jam, and it fits the rest of the album, but it, it, I have to say that it's probably one of the weaker notes on here. I, I don't know. I just I didn't get much out of it compared to the rest of the album. After that, we've got Lariat, which is the best song on the album, I think, personally. Maybe not the best, but everyone else will say it's the best. I have another personal favorite we'll get to in a second. It's this upbeat, poetic rock song about coming from the best decade ever. He doesn't miss pavement, not at all. 
In fact, I think he'd rather be playing with Pavement, to be honest, but... You know, that reunion just lasted 2010, and that was it. It's one of the strongest songs here, like I said. Houston, Hades. It's a fun little indie song about love with everyday people. It's very catchy. I swear, it, it just gets stuck, and it doesn't leave. After that, we get to... I, I really don't know. It's a weird song. It's an infectious bass line to it that's sort of just song, but... It would be a good song without the bass, but the bass definitely makes the song. It's a part punk part indie. I'd say half and half. Two part punk, two part indie. Still weird. Still awesome. Jay Smoove. It's actually a really cheesy, sentimental song for him. It, it makes good use of a low brass section to drive it along. Punk rock song about being a lifer. A rock and roll lifetime fan. This is like, I am the rock and roll of the 90s. I am complete. This is my motto. Or he's really making fun of us with himself included, I'm not sure. It's one or the other. He's either saying this is cool and this is what we should really live by, or you're an idiot. You're stupid. Your life is horrible. I really don't know. Char to the album, it's retro boogie. Sort of, as I said, he said it was influenced below. The album jumps around everywhere, but this is the definite jumping off point where it just has no real logic or sound to it at all. Just, eh, whatever, why not? After that, we get to Independent Street, which in fact, it was written as a tribute to him. The lyrics, delivery style, and everything about it sounds exactly like a Velvet Underground song. It's an album highlight for sure. This was really important to him because he actually knew Lou Reed very well. Scategories is the strangest song lyrically on here. It's a strange song about American board games. Your guess is as good as mine on that one. I have no idea. Cinnamon and Lesbians. That's right, you've heard me correctly. This is my favorite song on the album because it is, in fact, just as weird as it sounds. It's His wordplay is fantastic. It's strange. It's awesome. He doesn't care. Watch the music video. Seriously, I'll link it in the review when we put it up. It's just insane. He's doing what he wants, and he doesn't even have a clue. But he doesn't care. It's fun. That's all. Surreal Teenagers is the last song on the album. It's a beautiful... Beautiful. I can talk guitar-driven indie song about teenage life, love, pursuit of happiness, you know, all the fun stuff. It's another personal favorite. It's There's a lot of highlights. I'd say the highlights would be definitely Cinnamon and Lesbians, Surreal Teenagers, uh, Jace Move, and Lariat. Those are the four of my favorites on the album, actually. It's fun. It's weird. It's tough to really dive deep into because... It's just so strange. It doesn't jam like his last one with Mere Traffic, because, I don't know, Beck wasn't involved. This one was just taken easy from a standpoint of I want to write some music. And he did. So there we are. I'm going to give it three and a half stars. Thanks for checking this one out. I got a Bruce Springsteen review coming up. So, all right, first one of the new year. Yay!